Enough with embrace debate. Pointless yelling at each other on ESPN and Fox. Yet very little actual content. It's time for a change. A voice from the fan. For the fan. The most compelling topics in sports. All covered here. This is Corbett's Corner. Alright, welcome in. Uh, if uh, Those of you that listened to last week's episode of Wing It know... Uh, that I recorded a 40 minute or so Corbett's Corner, just straight, lots of topics, rat a tat tat, no breaks, and my mic was turned off. So once I uh, finished it and went to edit it, uh, it was virtually, it actually was essentially useless. So here I am in my new home, my new studio in Minnesota, uh, just outside a suburb of Minneapolis, kind of like where I lived in. Uh, Missouri, just outside of St. Louis, as most of you know, in Chesterfield. Um, we've got a new episode of Winging It coming out, of course, this week. So we're back on our usual day, dropping on Wednesdays. Um, we'll have Austin Platts and Jack Duncan in the cut for that. And this is I, Dylan Corbett, on Corbett's Corner, riding solo on a Tuesday. <clears throat> okay, lots to get to. NBA playoff season, Stanley Cup playoff season, the summer uh, we've got some postseason puck, some postseason hoops, and then we've got the uh, summer of baseball for a couple months before we get into college football. And of course, everyone's favorite, the King Sport NFL football. Some good UFC fights, too, coming up throughout the summer. We'll start with the NBA. Um, uh, playoffs have begun. I tried to get one out last week. Obviously, the useless Corbett's Corner without audio um, before the playoffs began, but they have started and l- let's get some notes out there. I put out on Twitter, I've got the Sixers uh, against the Lakers in the NBA finals. Um, I've got Sixers heat. How's that looking Ooh, in the Eastern conference finals? And I've got Lakers clips, the battle for LA in the Western conference. So let's dive into a couple of the matchups now that we have gotten some of the playoffs underway. Um, I initially had is Milwaukee in trouble doesn't look that way. They're up 2 nothing. most recently. The blowout last night of Miami, that thing was over by the first quarter. They won by, I think it was almost a 40-piece. Um, Bucks up 2-0. They're heading to Miami. I, the reason I like the Heat is because they took out the Bucks last year. Now, that was in the bubble. A lot of people think the Eastern Conference champs from last year, the Miami Heat, were, because of the bubble, a little bit of a fluke. You had the shooting lines, no crowd. A lot of people thought that the Bucks, which was one of the best regular season performances we saw up until the coronavirus stoppage of the regular season, kind of threw a wrench in their plans and they got bounced early by the Heat. So I thought the Heat matched up well. Uh, I wrote down it depends if Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero, who significantly regressed this year, were going to shoot the ball well like they did in the bubble. That hasn't been the case so far. Jimmy Butler was a non-factor last night. Bam on a bio, I think was four for 19 in game one. But the Heat should have won game one. So that's what's crazy is this series could, last night was a blowout, right? But this series could have just as easily been split 1-1, heading to South Beach, No restrictions there. Maybe you get the South Beach hangover game in a playoff atmosphere. You've got two titles in South Beach. Uh, Jimmy Butler's trying to get a third after making it to the final this past year. Um, So that's interesting. So that's a 2-0 series in the 3-6 matchup in the Eastern Conference, the Bucs and Heat. I I still got to stick to my prediction, right? I think the Heat um, still have an opportunity here, but obviously it's the cliche must win game here down two nothing game three coming back home. The reason I picked the heat was because I think no matter the winner of this series, heat or bucks, they're going to give the nets a lot of trouble. Now I've been kind of, uh, not subtle about my rooting for the 76ers. Cause I got a juicy f- future on them. I took back in January to win the Eastern conference or the top seed nets are the number two seed. They've got the Celtics. I thought the Celtics might give them a little trouble. They're just not good, right? Kemba Walker's not a good player, um, and it's tough, right? So they don't have Jalen Brown. So I, I think the Nets are going to sweep them, maybe gentlemen sweep. Nets Bucks would be a crazy series. I even think Nets Heat. I just think coming down to it, yes, is it the historic best offensive trio we've seen ever, probably. Well, you know, Steph, Clay, and KD, Draymond probably have a few words to say about that too, but. Uh, the defense, the lack thereof, three of the best offensive minds, offensive basketball players on one court sharing three of the five spaces on one half side of the floor. 
and three of the guys that do not like playing defense. Harden doesn't touch defense. KD, since the Achilles injury, is a significantly worse defensive player, just doesn't have that same motivation to be excellent on both sides of the floor, especially as he's getting older past his prime. Um, Kyrie has never been the best defender, right? He's more a magician with the basketball on the offensive end. Didn't I mean it was fine? The Celtics aren't very good, so they shot absolutely horrid in game one. Game two is tonight. I think the Nets will roll through the Celtics. I thought they might get some trouble there initially. It doesn't look that way. The Nets are good. I just wonder if they're gonna get through this road because it's gonna be the Celtics. Okay, that's a pretty tough seven seed to get through. Then you're gonna have to get through either the Heat or the Bucks. And then on top of that, if you get by there, you got the 76ers at the Nets, who are I believe favored now to win the NBA title since the Lakers will get into them in a little bit drop game one against the Suns Um, game two tonight, by the way, will LeBron get it done? They're favored by two. Like it'd just be an incredible run for the Nets to get through. And Hey, Tom Brady did it right. And they were a popular Super Bowl bet. Maybe the Nets could do it uh, for the NBA playoffs and lift up the Larry O'Brien. That would really be something for all three of those guys. I mean, it would solidify KD's legacy as one of the greatest of all time. It would elevate Kyrie up into that conversation that you might put with Kawhi. Um, and then Harden would finally get it right. So that would be crazy if the Nets could do it. But again, it's the good old super team. That's probably just how it has to be done in today's NBA. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, Nuggets Blazers. That was a fun game last night. Blazers, Dame time. They take game one, game two, Nuggets probably the MVP, Nikola Jokic. I was saying that I wanted Joel Embiid to win the MVP. I thought he had a very uh, sure case, but the injury hurt him. The injury might hurt Lamella Ball's case for Rookie of the Year against Anthony Edwards. The sixth man of the year was announced last night, awarded to Jordan Clarkson of the number one Utah Jazz. So I assume that the Rookie of the Year um, award will be coming in the next week or so. So I'll be interested to see how that pans out. Um, Jokic for the MVP. I think that's pretty much a lock. Um, the only reason I liked Embiid was because he had the better team. They were the one seed, right? And, they used, and I think you should kind of count what you're going to do in the playoffs. But again, we'll see how it pans out. Uh, Jokic gets game two. He went off last night. This is a toss up series for me. Um, winner of this is going to face either the Suns or the Lakers, right? So it's interesting. I had Lakers. Uh, rolling through the Suns until Colin Cowherd picked the Lakers to win the series. This dude has been a fade in the NBA in betting since he joined the Action Network. I think he's 8-20 and 20 now. Um, the NBA just got like his second win out of 11 tries. So that worried me. I had to, I t- was on the Lakers in game one. That did not work. They lost by nine, did not cover the two and a half points. They are two-point favorites now. And this happened last year, right? Portland, they take out the Lakers in the 1-8 game one uh, series of the playoffs in the bubble, and Stephen A. Smith comes on ESPN the next day and says it's over. Lakers sweeping. Charles Barkley says the Blazers are going to win the title. And then LeBron obviously goes on to gentlemen sweep them and then lift the trophy for L.A. himself. Um, Can he make magic happen twice? It's going to be a lot harder as a seven seed, right? Uh, the Suns, one of the more improved teams, Chris Paul, I, I've said before, and I'll say it again, one of my favorite players of all time. Uh, that dude is just a winner, even though he can't get it done for the official trophy, but he just makes every single team good. The Hornets, the team that drafted them, the Clippers, uh, he even went to the Thunder when he got traded there and he turned them into the playoff team. He turned the Suns from a borderline playoff missing team to the top of the Western Conference, the two seed. So, I mean, that would be crazy. So we'll see. It's the Lakers game two against the Suns tonight. Who you got? Um, How about LeBron just continuing to be an absolute crybaby? You see him looking for the cameras, given the the excuse. He's already laying the work for if they do get bounced by a very good Suns team. Oh, I I tore my rotator cuff. Did you see me writhing in pain in uh, game two? LeBron, for how dominant and great he is as a player on the court, he is just such a crybaby to me. He's just, he makes, and he does great humanitarian work. So I can't really say, like, I hate him as a person. I just hate the narratives he tries to spin. He's, he's a little bit of a narcissist. Um, so, I mean, LeBron, again, just crybaby LeBron, just absolutely insane. Clippers Mavericks, the other half of my uh, prediction of the all LA final. Mavs take game one. Clippers down one nothing. Remember, this was the first round of, uh, I believe, 2-7, the matchup in the bubble. 
and the Clippers went on to dispose of the Mavericks. Mavericks have the 1-0 advantage now, but look at this. It's a little deceiving. Of course they were going to end up winning one because playoff P showed up, right? Paul George, he was two for eight from deep. I can't let Kawhi off the hook either because I think he was two for nine. So that's where the discrepancy is. The Mavericks shot 47% from deep as a team. That's unheard of. Like that's a you're gonna win when you shoot 47% as a team from deep and you chuck up 37 threes, something like that. Uh, on the other hand, the Clippers mentioned Kawhi and Paul George's numbers as a team, they were at 27%. When you're shooting that, usually under 30% as a team that's not very good, that's below the mean, you're more likely gonna lose most of those games shooting below 30% from deep, especially in the today's NBA where it is a uh, three-pointer die. Uh, so again, I I've got the Clippers tonight. Game two is tonight. There are seven point favorites. They're still at home. I think that was a, a fluke shooting performance from the Mavericks and consequently with the Clippers, I think it'll co- kind of regress to the mean Clippers might light it up tonight and the Mavs might find more rim than not. Um, let's see here. How about the Hawks over the Knicks? I picked that from the get go. I think Tom Thibodeau is a great regular season coach. He did it with the Timberwolves. He did it with the Bulls. He's not a good coach when it comes to game planning, uh, seven game series, taking away Trey young. Uh, you saw in game one, the Hawks absolutely took away MVP candidate, Julius Randall. He was horrible. Uh, I think the Hawks are going to roll. I think, uh, one of the best things that happened in the NBA season quietly was, uh, the Hawks firing their coach Lloyd Pierce midseason, and then the Hawks went 27 and 10 from there on out. Uh, got the five seed. I mean, people are saying Tibbs should be coach of the year. How about this guy for? Isn't it Bickerstaff? I think it's JV Bickerstaff who took over as interim coach of the Hawks, and he's got the Hawks buzzing. Um, I think the Hawks are going to roll the Knicks. However, they're going to run into my 76ers. That's the team I'm rooting for at least this year. I've got them winning the title. I've got them winning the Eastern Conference. Um, Hawks, Knicks, I think that's an easy road no matter who comes out of that series. 76ers have a yellow brick road to the Eastern Conference Finals, and we'll see who they meet there and how they match up with who they meet there and then eventually see if they can take the conference. Um, Okay, so that does it for the NBA playoffs. Some exciting game twos tonight. The Lakers, Clippers, both in action. Um, all right, let's get to Stanley Cup. Vegas Wild last night. I had I was on Vegas money line. I thought they were going to get it done. Credit to the Wild for forcing game six. They're coming home. St. Paul. I'm going to be watching the game with a watchful eye tomorrow night, Wednesday night, uh, in downtown Minneapolis. We'll see if the Wild could force game seven back out west in Vegas. How about the Colorado Avalanche? Sorry, all you St. Louis Blues fans. Yeah, 4 0 sweep. Um, I thought I've got a future on Vegas. I took also back in January. I thought they were the best team in hockey, a team in their first expansion year, what, three years ago now? They made it all the way to the Stanley Cup finals, lost to the Capitals and uh, Ovechkin there. Uh, They've been a playoff team every single year. They've been in the NHL, I believe. And uh, it's either going to be Vegas or Colorado, right, with Nathan McKinnon. Because Colorado and Vegas, they were at the top of their division. They were arguably the top two teams in the NHL. I believe the Avalanche are favored. Um, And if it is Vegas, Colorado, they're in the same division and how it works in hockey this year in the 2021 season, they're going to have to play each other. So I think the winner of that is going to take the conference, but keep an eye out on some of these other matchups. Bruins, uh, they take out their opponent. They're waiting to see if the Islanders can get a six game series win against Pittsburgh. I've seen Penguins fans on Twitter just absolutely destroying their goaltending. They gave up an easy one in overtime. They've had a couple of overtime losses now in that series. Keep an eye out for whoever comes. I think all three of those teams could be dangerous. Um, And they'll potentially face either the Panthers, Tampa Bay, their division. Uh, The Canes and Preds are locked at two. Their game five is tonight. Uh, Tampa Bay just gave up the game five win to Florida. I'm a huge Levitard fan, so they're all over this Ice Cats team, and they're hoping that they can uh, have some magic here against the defending champs, the Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, But again, I think it's just all coming out of the division between the Avalanche and potentially the Vegas Golden Knights or the Minnesota Wild. Got to give them credit. Game six, Wednesday night. Hoping to talk to Eddie Kortz at some points here during the Stanley Cup playoffs. Want to get his thoughts as our resident hockey expert. Uh, Major League Baseball, first I've got a general question. Are you paying attention? Because, I mean, uh, I'm paying attention in terms of fantasy baseball. My beat the streak, right? You got to beat the streak. You get $5.6 million. Joe DiMaggio streak. I'm up to 11. How about that? 
Um, but fantasy, like I'm checking box scores. I'm checking scores. I'm checking the standings every day, seeing how the Cardinals are doing. But baseball, now that everything's kind of back to normal, right, mostly, there's just so many different things grabbing my attention to where I'll catch the highlights. I it, it's it really baseball does have a problem. Like I'll go to a game and enjoy a nine inning game live because I live I love live sporting events. But damn, like if I've got so many different options now at home versus like having to watch the Cardinals nine innings every single night and they're just you know a five game above five hundred team. Their run differential kind of suggests that they're a little bit worse than that. Baseball's got a problem, and that's what Theo Epstein, he left the Cubs to, to do. That's his job now is to kind of make baseball young again, to keep baseball in the attention spans of guys that aren't 50 or older, um, which is their average age demographic of their favorite fans. But baseball isn't doing anyone any favors when you got guys like Tony La Russa still hanging around. 70-year-old white guy who's had issues with, you know, racial discrimination against, you know, ethnic ball players, Latin ball players. All of a sudden, they Jerry Reinsdorf, another 70-year-old white guy in power, uh, thinks, hey, here, here's a great, uh, here's a great fit for our bat flipping Tim Anderson, Eloy Jimenez, your mean Mercedes. Here's a great fit to mesh with that clubhouse, Tony La Russa who's been out of baseball for 11 years. Well, he's been at, well, remember he was in the Diamondbacks front office. So again, St. Louis fans know La Russa, we win the world series in 2011. He retires. And then he all of a sudden goes to the Diamondbacks. He's in the front office, screws up that franchise horrifically that he loses his job there. Now he's in major league baseball because he's, you know, just he's, he created baseball, right? La Russa, he's smarter than everyone. He's still the face of baseball. Apparently. Um, and now after a role, I'm not quite sure he, what he actually did for major league baseball. He's all of a sudden named the manager of the white Sox after he was already inducted into the baseball hall of fame. And now in case you missed this, right? Cause it's baseball. A lot of things are moving faster than baseball. Now a week ago, the twins who are having their own terrible season in their own right. Uh, your mean Mercedes they've got a position pitcher in for the twins. who are just getting crushed by the white Sox. Ninth inning, 3-0 count, your mean Mercedes, who's a great story, right? He's a 28-year-old guy. He's kind of been in the minders, grinding, not getting much money. He comes up to the big leagues, and now he's one of the top hitters in the league in terms of average. He just belts one out to deep center, just swings at a 3-0 count. And, of course, all the 70-year-old white baseball purists are clutching their pearls. Oh, my God, you can't do that. You need to get thrown at. The clubhouse is what you have to keep here. And you had Tony La Russa not only saying, yeah, I didn't agree with what my own player did, but in doubling down and taking the side of the pitchers throwing at him the next game. And then tripling down with Lance Lynn, who's having a great season. He's one of the best pitchers on the team, one of the best pitchers in baseball so far, saying, hey, yeah, I you probably should loosen up on this kid. And Tony as I said, tripling down and saying, yeah, Lance, that's the reason you have a locker and I have an office. Bro, that locker room, I heard David Sampson, former uh, team president of the Miami Marlins for years, Montreal Expos before that. He said that's a fireable offense. If he's lost a locker room, the players will just, White Sox, I thought were the best team in baseball. They've got the talent to be the best team in baseball. But now they're playing for a manager that doesn't even like them, respect them. And the feeling's got to be mutual at that point. Small sample size. They've gone two and four since the incident. Okay, people are going to be like, well, what the hell? Something's going on here. I mean, Tony La Russa, he's a bad fit from the get-go, head-scratching fit from the get-go when they made this announcement. And voila it took almost less than two months before we have an incident that could derail the rest of the season we'll see so keep an eye on that um yeah that's all we have oh last thing gotta get to the julio jones knows uh news here corbett's corner dylan corbett running with you here solo on a tuesday shannon sharp undisputed skip and shannon you watching this i mean i see all their clips but i'm not sitting down watching them for two hours a day to talk about nothing and speaking of a whole lot of nothing, the live phone call between Shannon Sharp and Julio Jones, it was painfully, not scripted, but it was painfully like, you had to have run that by a production meeting. Shannon Sharp, you, you, it's like against the law to record someone 
uh, on the phone against their knowledge. So again, it was just very, it was very bizarre. A lot of show play and all this. You had Skip kind of gasping like an old woman as Sharp is talking to his nephew. Uh, it was very bizarre. I don't think Julio Jones is going anywhere. I've been very vocal about that. He can want to trade all he want. Julio has been the, one of the best, geez, one of the best receivers of all time. One of my favorite players to watch is an Atlanta Falcons uh, fan. But over the last four years since the Super Bowl collapse, Julio Jones, I think it was three years ago, holding out. He wants a new deal. Great, we give him that deal. What did they get us? They got a whole lot of injuries, not a lot of touchdowns, and a whole lot of cap casualties in terms of not being able to sign necessary positions we tied up so much in julio jones wound up finding maybe the next coming of julio jones and calvin ridley now we've got kyle pitts shit maybe a trade for julio isn't out of the question in terms of i I was thinking like you know why would we do this we want to keep the weapons he's still julio jones but man if he really doesn't want to be there and now he's just making a mess of it and this is you know in the last four years after everything we've done for julio and everything he's done for us i mean it was a little slap in the face i feel like in terms of what he's done for the falcons um i still think he's still got three years left on his contract i don't think they move him this year i if they're not getting a first rounder unless someone blows away the falcons with an offer which i don't think they're getting right now if you're not getting a first rounder for julio do not trade him it's not worth it It, that would be so silly uh, after upgrading the offense with the hopes of having julio as a part of it in the draft with the fourth pick in the draft. So keep an eye on that. I don't think Julio is going anywhere, but um, a lot of people will tell you maybe it's the Patriots. Maybe it's somewhere else. I'm not buying the, you know, the theater that we saw on undisputed with Shannon Sharp and skip Bayless. That'll do it for me. Dylan Corby here on the Tuesday winging it drops tomorrow. We've got the fellas Uh, check that out wherever you enjoy your podcast, YouTube. If you enjoy watching us, Uh, and CorbettSports.com is where you can find us on any of your favorite platforms. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you tomorrow.